the question is Senator Grassley, who would did you swap places with somebody else? And Solicitor General Kagan, glad to have you back. Hope you at least had a chance to have have some lunch. I did, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Good. Senator Grassley. <coughs> Glad to be with you, Ms. Kagan. Um, in an interview published May 2004, Metropolitan Corporate Council, you stated, quote, our courts are called upon to decide important matters, matters that often have great public impact. The attitude and views that a person brings to the bench make a difference in how they reach those decisions. So the Senate is right to take an interest in who these people are and what they believe, end quote. Could you explain what kind of attitudes and views you were talking about in the quote? What attitude and views would you bring to the Supreme Court? And so I'll stop here. Thirdly, and most importantly, how will they make a difference in how you reach decisions? And make a difference is words out of your quote. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Uh, this really goes back to the, the questions I started with Senator Leahy about. Senator Leahy asked me, did I think that the Senate had an important role to play in this process? And I said, yes, it did, that the matter of confirming a Supreme Court justice is a highly significant one for the country and that the Senate has an important role to play and that different justices approach constitutional interpretation differently, approach statutory interpretation differently, and that the Senate has both an opportunity but I think also a responsibility to try to uh, delve into those matters and to try to figure out okay. what stances, what approaches a person is likely to bring to the court. And I tried to suggest to Senator Leahy earlier the kind of approaches I'd, I'd use um, with respect to constitutional interpretation that I thought that a variety of Justices should appropriately look to a variety of sources that I didn't have a grand theory with respect to constitutional interpretation, that I'm more pragmatic in my approach to constitutional interpretation, that I believe justices, depending on the particular provision, depending on the particular case, depending on the particular issue, should look to text, to history, to traditions, to precedent, certainly, and to the principles embodied in that precedent. The attitudes and views that you have, how will they make a difference in how you will reach a decision? Well, I think that approach to interpretation, to constitutional interpretation, uh, is the one that I would bring to the court and is the one that, that I would use on the court. And that's an approach that, that might be different than some other people, same as uh, it's, some people have that approach, some people have a different approach. And I think that uh, those differences do matter. Yeah, I'd like to go to Second Amendment. Uh, in Sandage versus United States, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals held that the Second Amendment only protects a collective right not an individual right, upholding D.C.'s handgun ban and registration requirements. A version of this law was later overturned in Heller. As a clerk to Justice Thurgood Marshall, you recommended against Supreme Court review. Your entire legal analysis was this, quote, Petitioner's sole contention is that the District of Columbia's firearms statutes violate his constitutional right to keep and bear arms. I am not sympathetic, end of quote. Why were you not sympathetic? Were you not sympathetic to that challenge because it was your belief that the Second Amendment protects collective, not individual right to keep and bear arms? Senator, Senator Grassley, I recommended that the court 
uh, that Justice Marshall votes to deny certiorari in that case. This was 20 years before Heller. The state of the law was very different. No court, not the Supreme Court and no appellate court, had held that the Second Amendment protected an individual right. Uh, and indeed, none of the justices on the court at that time voted to take certiorari in that case. It was um, by when, when the Supreme Court took cert in Heller, what a circuit court had held that the Second Amendment protected an individual right. There was a conflict in the circuits. It was ripe for Supreme Court review. But at this time, no court had held that. It had um, long been thought, uh, starting from the Miller case, that uh, the Second Amendment did not protect such a right. And as I say, no justice voted to accept certiorari in that case. Now, the Heller decision has marked a very uh, fundamental moment in the court's jurisprudence with respect to the Second Amendment. And as I suggested to Senator Feinstein, uh, there's no question that going forward, Heller is the law, that it is entitled to all the precedent that any decision is entitled to. Um, uh, and that's true of, of McDonald as well with respect to McDonald's holding that the Second Amendment applies to the states, and uh, that's what I would apply. So then, uh, if there had been the Heller case existed, you would have been sympathetic to the challenge, and so the words I'm not sympathetic were related to what you thought the law was at that time. It's, it certainly was, Senator Grassley. It would have been an entirely different case had Heller existed prior to that certiorari petition. I'd like to continue on Second Amendment. Uh, the Supreme Court held, as you know, in Heller, that the Second Amendment included an individual right to possess firearms, not a collective right conditioned by participation of the militia. Yesterday, the Supreme Court ruled in McDonald that the individual right recognized in Heller is applied to the states through the doctrine of incorporation via the 14th Amendment. Do This is not a, a comment on the case, but do you personally believe that the Second Amendment includes an individual right to possess firearm? Well, I do think that Heller is the law going forward. I have not had myself the occasion to delve into the history uh, uh, that the court dealt with in Heller, but I have absolutely no reason to think that uh, the court's analysis was uh, incorrect in any way. I accept the court's analysis and uh, will apply it going forward. So whether you personally believe that Heller's or the right to bear arms is a collective or an individual right will have no bearing in the future. But endowed by our government. So the question here is, are we endowed by our Constitution with this uh, right, or did it exist before the Constitution existed? 
Well, Senator Grassley, I do think that my responsibility would be to apply the Constitution as understood and um, uh, prior, previously applied by the court, and that means as understood and, and uh, interpreted by the court in Heller, and that's what I would do. Uh, so I, I think that the, the, the fundamental legal question would be whether you know, that a case would present would be yeah. whether the Constitution guarantees an individual right to bear arms, and uh, uh, Heller held that it did, and that's good precedent going yeah. forward. I know the Declaration of Independence is not the law of the land, but it does express the philosophy of why we went to war and uh, why our country exists. And you understand, I hope, that if we're endowed by our government with certain rights, the government can take them away from us. Whereas if we possess them ourselves and give them up from time to time to the government to exercise in our stead, then the government can't take away something that's inherently ours. Uh, do you believe that the Second Amendment right to bear arms is a fundamental right? Senator Grassley, I think that that's what the court okay. held in McDonald. Uh, and and you agree with it? Good precedent going forward. In response to questions from Senator Leahy and Feinstein, you stated that Heller and McDonald are now settled law. Do you agree with the decisions in Heller and McDonald as an individual, uh, uh, not, not as a Supreme Court justice, but do you believe in them as a, as a, a, fun, a settled law personally? I, I do think that those decisions are settled law and are entitled to all the weight that any precedent of the Supreme Court has. Okay. Will you follow stare decisis and uphold Heller and McDonald? I will follow stare decisis with respect to Heller and McDonald as I would with any case. When you became dean of Harvard Law School, you spearheaded a sweeping overhaul of the academic curriculum. One change required students to take an international or comparative law course during their first year. You said, quote, we're in a new world, and an internationalization is an example. There's a recognition that a traditional curriculum does not provide some of what lawyers today need to know. I don't disagree with that statement. You also said that the first year of law school is the foundation of legal education. Those four words are your words. Because what students learn in that year, quote, shapes their sense of what the law is, its scopes, its limits, and its possibilities. I agree that the first year of law school is critical in framing a future lawyer. I also believe that taking an international law course is worthwhile. However, I'm troubled by your failure to recognize the obvious importance of requiring a class in constitutional law. I'm troubled by your decision to shape a student's understanding of the U.S. constitutional law, if any, through the eyes of foreign legal systems, some of which have little respect for the value and principles that we hold so dear in this country. Surprisingly, constitutional law is not a first-year requirement at Harvard. In fact, it isn't even a requirement to graduate from law school. Yet almost all the top law schools across the United States require their students to take a constitutional law course to graduate, and it's usually a first-year requirement. When you said that, quote, the traditional curriculum does not provide some of what lawyers today need to know, end of quote, are you saying that they don't need to know uh, constitutional law? And why, then, is it more important for a law student to take an international law course than a course in U.S. constitutional law? In other words, which is more important, our Constitution, uh, other nations' constitutions and laws? Our, our constitutional law is absolutely basic. When we were doing the curricular review of the law school some years ago, we did think about um, uh, what should be in the first year. One of the questions we considered was whether to put some constitutional law in the first year. Harvard has long taught constitutional law in the second and third year. Since as far back as I can remember, I know that when I was a student, it was taught in the second and third year. And we had a very serious discussion among our faculty as to whether to put constitutional law in the first year, as some schools do. Although the two schools I've taught at, both Harvard and the University of Chicago, 
teach constitutional law in the second and third year. And the reason for that is really a sense that students are better equipped to understand and to appreciate and to really delve into thoroughly all the subtleties and complexities of constitutional law issues in the second and third year. And that when you put it in the first year, it actually shortchanges constitutional law because you can only give students a very small um, uh, uh, amount of what they really should know. So both at Harvard and in the University of Chicago, it's taught in the second and third year where it can be stretched out over a longer stretch of time where students can delve more deeply into it and also study it more broadly. Now we did decide when we were doing this curricular review, we did decide to put uh, some more constitutional law in our first year. And the way we did that was through a course that focused on the governmental process, legislation, regulation. And that course um, uh, uh, is in part a, an in introduction to constitutional law because it focuses quite a lot on separation of powers issues. So in fact, during that curricular review, although we decided, and the constitutional law faculty felt extremely strongly about this, that constitutional law primarily be kept in the upper years where students can deal with it in a much more sophisticated and in-depth way we did put some constitutional law into the first year curriculum, specifically separation of powers issues in a course that we devoted to the governmental process. But in the process of your explanation, you're justifying that uh, uh, constitutional law is less of a foundation course uh, than uh, international law, are no, you not? Uh, uh, Senator Grassley, um, constitutional law is absolutely basic. The Harvard faculty, has decided that it's actually best taught and most thoroughly taught uh, and most broadly taught when it is done in the second and third years. Um, uh, almost all students take a, a very uh, wide set of constitutional law issues, more than they could do in the first year at Harvard. Um, so I think it's absolutely basic to our understanding of who we are as a people and certainly to the knowledge of lawyers. Now, I do think that international law is something that all uh, law students today should be familiar with. I know that the students who graduate from Harvard, they go out, they do international litigation, they do international arbitrations, they do international business transactions. They you said do I didn't disagree with you on the importance of international law. Let me go on, please. Should judges ever look to foreign law for quote, unquote, good ideas, should they get inspiration for their decisions from foreign law? Well, Senator Grassley, I, I guess I'm in favor of good ideas coming from wherever you can get them. Um, uh, so in that sense, I think for a judge to read a law review article or to read a book about legal issues uh, or to read uh, the decision of a uh, state court, even though there's no binding effect of that state court, uh, or to read the decision of a foreign court to the extent that uh, you learn about how different people um, might approach and have thought about approaching legal issues. But I don't think that foreign law uh, should have uh, uh, independent precedential weight in any um, but a very, very narrow set of circumstances. Uh, so, so I would draw a distinction between uh, looking wherever you can find them for good ideas, for um, uh, j just to expand your knowledge of the way in which judges approach legal issues, um, but, but making that very separate from using foreign law as, as precedent or as independent weight. Fundamentally, we have an American constitution. Our constitution is our own. Uh, it's, it's the text that we've been handed down from generation to generation. It's the precedents that have developed over the course of the years. Um, and except with respect to uh, a very limited number of issues, uh, that Constitution uh, ought to, the, 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 the fundamental sources of legal support and legal argument for that Constitution uh, ought to be American. Which foreign countries would you suggest we look to for good ideas? Oh, Senator Grassley, I, I guess I would say again what I started with, which is, 
you can look to uh, good ideas wherever they come from. Um, uh, you, you know, I, 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 there's a, a, a brief that we filed recently in the Supreme Court. The Solicitor General's office filed it. It regarded a, a Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act case. And in the course of that brief, um, we noted a number of different foreign precedents regarding what other nations do with respect to the immunity of foreign officials. So, you know, that's the kind of way in which I think um, uh, uh, having an awareness of uh, what other nations are doing, uh, you know, might be, might be useful. Some judges and maybe justices have said that our influence in the world should be a factor that a judge consider in constitutional interpretation. So do you believe that our influence in the world should be a factor that judges consider in constitutional interpretation? Senator Grassley, I think judges should let the President and the Congress worry about our influence on the world. I think that that's um, not something that, that judges should uh, pay much attention to, uh, should pay any attention to. If confirmed, would you rely on or cite international foreign law when you decide cases? Well, Senator Grassley, I, I guess I think it depends. There are some cases in which the citation of foreign law or international law might be appropriate. We spoke uh, earlier, I, I forget with which of the senators, about the Hamdi opinion. The Hamdi opinion is one in which the question was how to interpret the authorization for the use of military force. And Justice O'Connor in that case uh, one of the ways that she interpreted that statute was by asking about the law of war and what the law of war usually provides, what authorities the law of war provides. And that's a circumstance in which, uh, in order to interpret a statute giving the president various wartime powers, uh, the court thought it appropriate to look to what the law of war generally provided. So, um, so there are a number of circumstances, I think. I mean, another example would be Suppose you know the, uh, the the president has the power to recognize ambassadors in under Article Two, and there might be a question: Well, um, uh, who counts as an ambassador? And one way to understand that question is is uh, to look at what international law says about what who counts as an ambassador, and that might or might not be determinative, but it would be um, uh, you know possibly something to think about and 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 something to cite. In your, uh, you wrote in your Oxford thesis, quote, judges will have goals, and because this is so, judges will often try to mold and steer the law in order to promote certain ethical values and achieve certain social ends. Such activity is not necessarily wrong or invalid. And then in addition, quote, and yet no court should make or justify its decisions solely by reference to demands of social justice. These issues should be based upon legal principle and reason. They should appeal no less to our intellectual than to our ethical sense. If a court cannot justify a ruling in terms of legal principle, then the court should stay its hand. No uh, colon, no judge should uh, hand down a decision that cannot plausibly be grounded in principles referable to an accepted source of law. If, on the other hand, a court can justify a ruling in terms of legal principle, then the court must make every effort to do so. Judicial decisions must be based, above all, on law and reason. Is it appropriate for judges to mold and steer the law? Senator Grassley, all I can say about that paper is that it's, it's, it's dangerous to write papers about the law before you've spent a day in law school. So uh, I, I wrote that paper when before I spent a day in law school. I was trying to think about whether to go to law school, and I decided to write a paper about law in order to figure out whether I was interested in the subject. And I discovered that I was interested in the subject, and I went to law school, where I found out that I might have been interested in the subject, but I didn't know much about the subject at the time. And um, so I, I, would, I, would, uh, I, would, I, would, I would just uh, ask you to, uh, to recognize that I didn't know a whole lot of law then, and, um, and there are, um, uh, uh, I didn't know a whole lot of law then. 
You know, if I accept your answer, uh, it's going to spoil the whole five minutes I had here. <laughs> but let me... Chuck, uh, Chuck, go ahead and accept it. <laughs> uh, let, let me enjoy it anyway, will you? <laughs> when you said that, quote, no court should make or justify its decision solely by reference to the demands of social justice, end of quote, are you saying that it is acceptable for a court to make and or justify its decision based upon, quote, the demands of social justice, end of quote, and if so, whose, quote, unquote, demands of justice are you referring to? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is to just to ask that what I just said about that paper just be repeated for the record. And, th and now I'll say, no, I, I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's appropriate to decide cases based on demands of social justice that are external to the law uh, uh, that, that ought to be applied to the case, whether that's constitutional law or statutory law. Okay. Well, let me leave that then and say that you learned a lot in, in the, by going to law school. I'm not sure I say that to very many people. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not a lawyer, you know. Uh, let me go to uh, one of your heroes, Barack. Because you don't have any judicial experience, we have no concrete examples of how you decide cases, so we have to look elsewhere for clues as to what your judicial philosophy might be, including your judicial role models, because we have to assume that you agree with their judicial method. I am troubled by the fact that you hold up Judge Barack to be a judicial role model, You've called him your quote-unquote judicial hero. Judge Barack's judicial philosophy is undeniably act activist and seen by many as a brazen abuse of power. He's been described as having, quote, created a degree of judicial power undreamt of by most aggressive U.S. Supreme Court justice, end of quote. For example, Judge Barack believes that, quote, a judge has a role in the legislative project, project end of quote. Will you look to Judge Barack's judicial method as a model for deciding cases? I will not, Senator Grassley. I, I do admire Justice Barack, who was, of course, um, uh, was for many years the Chief Justice of, of, of the State of Israel. I do admire him. He is very often called the John Marshall of the State of Israel because he was central in creating an independent judiciary for Israel and in ensuring that Israel, a young nation, a nation threatened from its very beginning in existential ways, and a nation without a written constitution, he was central in ensuring that Israel, with all those kinds of uh, liabilities, would become a very strong rule of law nation. And that's why I admire Justice Barack, not for his particular judicial philosophy, uh, not for any of his particular decisions, um, as you know, I don't think it's a secret. I am Jewish. Uh, the state of Israel has, has meant a lot to me and my family. And, uh, and I admire Justice Barak for what he's done for the state of Israel in ensuring an independent judiciary. So then I suppose I can assume that you would disagree with his statement that, quote, a judge has a role in the legislative project, end of quote. I do disagree with that. I okay. think that the legislative role and the judicial role are fundamentally different and that judges owe a great deal of deference to legislatures and should not, um, uh, at, at the legislative way of thinking is entirely different from the judicial way of thinking. Uh, and, 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 and judges should think of themselves, as I, I indicated before, only as policing the constitutional boundaries, only as ensuring that the legislature does not overstep its constitutional role by interfering with the states or, or, um, or by violating individual rights. But certainly, the judges should not be doing uh, what the legislature ought to be doing, which is making the fundamental policy decisions for this nation. One last statement he made, and I assume you would disagree with this as well, and at Harvard Law, he spoke, quote, there are cases in which a judge carries out his role properly by ignoring the prevalent prevalent social consensus and becoming a flag bearer of new social consensus, or would there be some time you might find that appropriate uh, in, uh, for the Supreme Court to take a leap like that? Well, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, what 
he meant by that, but if uh, he meant that the court should um, uh, sort of uh, make decisions that the American people are uh, – that more appropriately should make, you know, the, the sort of fundamental policy decisions of our society, uh, I, I don't agree with that. As, as, as I said, um, uh, I was talking about Justice Barack and my admiration for Justice Barack comes from – his important role at the State of Israel in ensuring an independent judiciary and, and most fundamentally in ensuring um, that Israel is this strong rule of law nation. Uh, last question. Do you agree with uh, – do you believe that Judge Barack endorses a philosophy of judicial restraint or judicial activism? I think that Justice Barack's uh, uh, philosophy <clears throat> is, is, is so uh, different from anything that we would use or would want to use in the United States. I mean, for one thing, uh, Israel is a country without any written constitution, a very fundamental difference from the United States. So uh, nothing about what I said about Justice Barack suggests in any way uh, that I think that his ideas about the judge's role uh, uh, in um, uh, constitutional interpretation should be transplanted to the United States. Thank you. And I'll just put in the record uh, what Justice Antonin Scalia said about, as he said, his good friend Judge Barack, when they gave him the American Association of Jewish Lawyers Pursuit of Justice Board, and Justice Scalia uh, expressed his profound respect for the man, and what Judge Richard Posner, a um, conservative luminary, <coughs> described him. Um, uh, by saying if there were a Nobel Prize for law, uh, Judge Barack would probably be an early recipient. But then there, and I'd also note on the question of looking at foreign law, I'll stick on the record, but another um, uh, nominee said to, to us, and I think this is the question asked the public inside, there are other legal issues that come up in which I think it is legitimate to look to foreign law and then give some examples. It is something that's useful to look to. That was uh, Justice Alito, and I, I just note that parenthetically that every Republican voted for him. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I, I, can only, I can only assume that with your quick comeback, you have a copy of my notebook. Uh, you probably wonder why there was a door to your shed that was open this morning. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, let Senator me just Lee. say, um, I respect the chairman's prerogative, but I don't think we should be in a situation where the chairman rebuts uh, the questioning of each and every uh, witness on this side. I think it kind of alters the dynamics. I would just say with regard to uh, Justice Scalia's comments about Mr. Barack at that same comment, unlike Dean Kagan, he expressed a clear difference of philosophy about the activist vision that uh, uh, just, uh, Justice Barack has for the role of a judge. Judge Posner said his, uh, that Judge Barack's activism exceeds anything un, un, uh, dreamed of by the most activist American judge. And uh, I think you misquoted and failed to quote completely oh, uh, the uh, nature of those two people's comments. And there is a raging debate in this country, and no one denies it, over the extent to which foreign law can be cited to define the Constitution and laws of this country. Well, we'll and put, we'll I, put don't, the... I would assume that this nominee, he, uh, from her statements, would be on the side of Justice <coughs> Ginsburg, who favors that. And I'll, I'll, re, I'll reclaim, reclaim we we'll have plenty of time to debate this. I, as you know, I gave uh, Senator Grassley extra time, and then I responded with an equal amount of time, and we will put into the record, and of course, I would yield to anybody who wanted to put something in the record, just exactly what Justice Alito said, and uh, Judge Posner said, and, uh, and, um, Judge Scalia said. And Senator Leahy, if I might just make uh, w one last point. I, I made these remarks about Justice Barack when he came to Harvard Law School to give a speech 
one of the things that I did as dean of law school was I gave introductions. I gave introductions to many, many people. If any of you had come to Harvard Law School, I would have given you a great introduction, too. Thank you. And with that, I'll yield to... Uh, <clears throat> would we be...